Psalm 119 while I'm jibber jabbering. Um, Except the Lord build the house, I labor in vain that build it. And uh, yeah, it's Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, I labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And as long as God's in it, we'll do it. And if God says shut it down, we'll shut it down. And uh, we'll just do the Lord's will. Um, I want to speak the truth. I want to know the truth. I want to speak the truth. First little get-together that I was ever invited to was down at my grandmother's church down in North Little Rock. And um, before I was nervous, before I, and this was around 1998, 99, somewhere around in there. And before I went down there, I spent some time with the Lord in prayer. And I said, God, I don't want to lie to anybody. I don't want to be dishonest. I don't want to say something that isn't what you say in your word. Now, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So what I know about me is I'm not capable of telling the truth 100% of the time. And nobody is. This is why we have a standard for everything that we're going to believe. And deception is moving in anywhere. Psalm 119 is a psalm, if you don't know it, if you're not familiar with it, it's a psalm about the Bible. It's about God's statutes, His commandments, His laws, His covenants, His word. Uh, and just various verses out of here just really jump out at me. Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. That's one we all know and are familiar with. Um, look at, oh, let's see here. Look at verse 126. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. How many churches? We passed by a church. My goodness, I've never seen a church that big in Arkansas. Uh, this, what is that, 49 runs down north and south there. We was down there and we passed by this church called the cross. Oh, y'all know it. Okay. Well, in my opinion, to get that big as a church, you got to leave some stuff out that you don't say anymore or people won't come. That's my opinion, but I think that's what the Bible's telling us. Straight is the way and narrow. Okay? And so they make void the law of God. The law of God is what you're holding in your hand. 127, therefore I love thy commandments above gold. Yeah, above fine gold. I'd rather know the truth than have money. Verse 128, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. I was looking for that verse a while ago. God helped me see it. And I'm telling you, that's me. I have have believed lies before. I have told lies before. I don't like it. And what they're meant to do is they're meant to put people in bondage. Look at verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning. You believe that? Say amen. Amen. So that means that Genesis 1-1 is right. Genesis 1-2 is right. Genesis 1-3 is right. All of those verses in Genesis 1 are exactly right. That's how God everything. And we believe that. And we will get ridiculed for believing that, but you might as well believe it. Amen? Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. I think this Bible is more relevant to us now than it ever has been. In fact, if we believe that Jesus is still yet to come, and I do, that means that he's coming to do what's in this book. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And if it was good enough for Jesus to do it, it's good enough for us uh, at verse 163, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies for all my ways are before thee and all kinds of good things like that. Somebody say amen. Revelation chapter 4, you're there, say amen. amen. After this, and I looked and the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, 
talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. I love this. Uh, you've heard me teach on the body. Your heart is the throne. So what you're seeing here in heaven, what's in heaven matches what is in earth. If Paul said that this body was the temple, he meant exactly that. He wasn't kidding. Every cell in our body is a picture of the wilderness tabernacle. The bone structure and this area of our body here is a picture of the temple of God. So think of the heart as the throne of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart. We ask Jesus into our heart. It is that the heart, and that's very important to remember in relation to what I'm going to show you tonight. The heart is, the heart determines whether or not you're going to believe the truth or you're going to believe a lie. Yes. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we've, we've got brain and, okay, that's one thing. But it's the heart. And the Bible says that specifically. Okay, man believes in his heart whether or not God's word is true or not. So, think about the heart. Is Jesus sitting on the throne? So, the heart is the throne of God. Um, I was in the Spirit, verse 2, and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Who is that one? Yeah, amen. In the, uh, uh, there, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So there's one sitting on the throne. Not two, not three, just one. Verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were the four and twenty seats. You have, if this is the, if this is the throne, you have these ribs that surround your heart. They go from here, the sternum, and connect to the back. You have twelve on this side and twelve on that side. That's twenty-four. And they surround the throne of God. Just like Revelation 4 says. Somebody, oh, isn't that neat? White raiment, they had to have, on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Well, have you ever heard your heartbeat? You ever listen to your heartbeat? What does it sound like? Thunder. How does the heart beat? What does it operate on? What causes those muscles to contract? Lightning, electricity. Okay, so there it is. And voices, your voice box is here. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Your lungs are the seven spirits of God. You have seven brachial trees, branches, that branch off from here that go down into the two lungs, uh, four on one side, three on the other. That's seven. And the two, you have two lungs because your Bible is rightly divided between Old Testament and New Testament. And does, does your body care which lung it gets its oxygen from? No. Re get it. Amen. The, and here's the oxygen. Here's the air right here. All scripture is given by inspiration. That word inspiration is, rest, is related to respiration. Breathing in, breathing out. It is God breathed. It is the word of God. You read the word of God. It goes into the body. It goes into the body. This church is the body of Christ. Amen. So the two lungs represent the in the New Testament. And again, read it. Read a little Old Testament one day. Read a little New Testament the next day. Oh, let's see here. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne. So around the throne is a sea of glass. When Solomon built the temple and where he had prepared in the most holy place for the Ark of the Covenant, he had these uh, four, I think they were bulls, that supported a, a firmament-like, like a crystal platform where the Ark of the Covenant was going to sit. Um, in Ezekiel 28, the Bible talks about how the prince of Tyrus, which is Satan, he says, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. So if the heart is the throne, then the pericardium, which is a sack of water that surrounds your heart, is the sea of glass clear, clear as crystal. Pericardium full of water. This Bible's right, amen. And then you have the four living creatures, the lion, the calf, the man, and like a flying eagle, you have four chambers in your heart, so on and so on. What I wanted to concentrate on was the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God. Turn to Revelation 5. We have a book in God's right hand. The right hand is always a picture of God's power. It's the right hand of power. The New 
Testament is on the right hand of your Bible. That's not an accident. I don't believe that's an accident. The left, my left, I'm right handed. My left hand is weak. There are things I cannot do. Do not ask me to do it with my left hand. Do not ask me to sign my name with my left hand. Well, it kind of looks like how I sign my name with my right hand too. So, it's... <laughs> Anyway, but there are things, my right hand is stronger than my left hand. And if you think about it, the New Testament could do what the Old Testament could never do. Amen. It's, that's where the power is. So here's the book in God's right hand. They're looking for somebody to open it. Verse 5, nobody can open it. Verse 5, one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion. Amen. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So while you're reading the Bible, God, Jesus himself comes and he opens up your understanding. He unseals it for you. That's how you, you in the pews have as much right to know what this Bible says as the man behind the pulpit does. Amen. Amen. So, uh, verse, uh, where was I? Verse 6, I beheld lo in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Notice that he has seven horns and seven eyes. This is Jesus. And those seven horns and those seven eyes represent the seven spirits of God. Seven is God's number for perfection, completion. You can look in Genesis 7 and find that out. You can look at what God said in Genesis 2 about the Sabbath day and figure out that the number seven is God says, I'm done, this is it, it's over with. The number eight is for new beginnings. So in Genesis 7, God floods the world, He ends it. In Genesis 8, He starts it all over again. How many people's on the ark? Eight. And they walk off that ark into a new world and start everything all over again. Isn't that neat? Now, what are those seven spirits? Turn to Isaiah 11. By the way, those seven horns, the seven horns, think, and I, I love this, the Bible has a picture of every doctrine, Every doctrine, every prophecy, there's a picture of it somewhere in the Bible. If you read the Bible, and why are these stories all here? They're there for a reason. So think of someone with seven things on their head in the Bible. Someone in the Bible that had seven things on their head. Samson. What did he have on his head? The seven locks were the seven horns that the Lamb has in Revelation chapter 5, and those are the seven spirits of God. Where, did, where was Samson's source of power? His hair, his locks, his seven locks. So what did Delilah do? Took his power away. You see what's happening? See what's going on in churches? See what's going on in our country? God's power is being taken out because the Bible, the Word of God. So Genesis, uh, Isaiah 11 is going to list for you the seven spirits of God. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch, a branch that's capitalized, shall grow out of his roots. That branch is Christ. Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. And so we also will have the seven spirits of God. If we are part of the vineyard of Jesus Christ, we then will have these seven spirits of God. And the Spirit of the Lord, that's the first one. Spirit of the Lord. That means God's in charge. He is the Lord. He calls the shots. He's the head. Amen? Shall rest upon Him. The second one is the Spirit of Wisdom. What's the third one? Understanding. The fourth one. Counsel. The fifth one. Might. The sixth one. Knowledge. The seventh one. The fear of the Lord. You know, verse 2, there's 33 words exactly in that verse. 33 words exactly. Who was 33? And he had the seven spirits of God, didn't he? He was these seven spirits of God. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. So, have you ever seen somebody who went to church for a season, a while, a time, and then something happened, and they started believing wacky stuff, stupid stuff, or 
They just quit believing what God said. Have you ever witnessed that in somebody's life? Who knows somebody like that? Raise your hand. You're on camera, so raise your hand. Everybody, everybody, I got people watching you right now, so raise your hand. Okay? I, I've had several, I've watched this. I've been in the ministry a long time. I've had more people leave our church than come in. Well, this, yeah, okay. Yeah, we've had a lot of people leave. Some of them just started believing. They just went off the charts. One guy I know started believing that the earth was flat. I'm here to tell you the earth's not flat. It's not. Don't believe that. But this, this, this guy, it bugged me. He was a scientist. He, he had degrees. He was a smart guy. But all of a sudden, he starts believing that the earth is flat. And you have to, in order to do that, you have to believe all the other stuff that goes with it. All the contradictions of the Bible that goes with it. That heaven, where God is, is not an unfathomable distance from us. There's a hard shell dome over the earth and that's where heaven is and that's where God is. That's what they believe. They have to believe this stuff. There's never, there are no satellites. According to the flat earth people, there are no satellites anywhere. Those do not exist. You're not getting satellite transmissions. You're, nobody is. That's all make-believe. All the pictures of space and the moon, and that's all made up. They said that it's all make-believe. And some of these people really believe this. And this guy fell for it. And that bugged me. Because I thought, how, how did this happen? How is it that he could believe against the evidence of the scriptures this idea? And there's other things that he believes too. The internet has done some good, but it's also done a lot of harm. Because now everybody with some off-the-wall doctrine can say it and they'll have thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. And people will be left in deception everywhere. So, Isaiah 33, 6. That's what I have up on the screen. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability. These are two of the spirits of God. It's the wisdom. Wisdom and not knowledge. Know what this Bible says. Know what this Bible says. Shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. And the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Strength of salvation. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and what's happened to me in the last several months. God has blessed me with bouts of depression and anxiety. In the last several months, He's blessed me with that. I don't know why God has sent that my way, but there are days that I just shake. I don't know why. And you get all these thoughts. If you, I preached on this at our church Sunday and had some great responses. Because a lot of people deal with this. I know pastors. I know pastors. Good, solid men in the Word of God who are now dealing with it or have dealt with it in the past. Names that some of them you would know that have dealt with depression, anxiety. And they're supposed to preach while they've got all this thought going through their head. They'd rather be weak and so God can be strong the other way around. Okay, tonight, by the way, I'm not, but I've had, I've, I have stood behind the pulpit literally shaking before. So, seek stability. And I get it from this book. When the thoughts run through my head that I know are a lie, then I'll go to this book and let God say to me what I know to be the truth. To counter the lies that are going through my head. Shall be the stability of thy time. Strength of salvation. Your salvation needs strength. And it's not going to be you that keeps yourself saved. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. All of Satan's power. What Satan can do, read the book of Job. That's what he can do. 
with all power and signs and lying wonders and grounded. Those who, are, those who have wisdom and knowledge to have the stability to go through that. With all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. What's the truth? It said thy word is truth. John 17. That there's two types of saved and lost. Lost people are going to believe the lies. The saved people won't. Jesus tell us that shall try to deceive the very elect. The word very does not mean like a higher level of elect. It means truly. The ones who are really saved. There are fake Christians. Be sitting here tonight. I wouldn't know it. You could be deceived. You could have, oh, I'll get to that in a little bit. I'll show you how it works. But you could be deceived. Verse 11, for this cause, God shall send them strong illusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. By the way, sin, you. Your sin. Yes. Isaiah 66, turn there. Saith the Lord, but to this man will him that is poor of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. He that killed the lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered and he that burneth incense as if he yea, they have chosen their own ways. When it's time for people to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead it will be by their choice to receive that. They're not going to be dragged, kicking, and screaming. I don't want that. They're going to go right here. Put it right here. Or put it right here. They have chosen this. The same way, hopefully, you've chosen. You're not going to receive that. Their soul delighteth in their abominations. Verse 4, I also will choose their delusions. I will choose this. So now this really shook me. When you know people that at one time you thought were solid, when you knew preachers that at one time you thought were solid, church people, deacons, Sunday school teachers, elders, whoever, you knew people that at one time you thought were solid and all of a sudden now they've gone off some other way. God chose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. They didn't believe the Bible. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. So again, we could go back through Psalm 119. What Mike Hoggard said was true. I'm going to know it. Bless people like that. But those who turn their back on the word of God, God will send them. Right, here is uh, on the screen here on her left is a man by the name of Elon got his hand in other companies. Elon Musk gave a dire warning. He saw the way technology was going, all the way these computers were going. Artificial intelligence and how much of what we do every day is based upon artificial intelligence. Here talks to your phone. Siri, oh Siri, or hey Google. Find this for me. Or Amazon, we need more toilet paper. Not some guy in a cubicle listening to you. There is a computer listening to you, hearing what you said, responding to what you said. It's a miracle. Right now, there are servants. But that's going to change. Because what we're doing is we're making a God. A God that because of the internet, 
can hear things and see things and know things. My goodness, I can't write an email anymore without Google finishing my sentences. It's getting to where the computer knows more about what we want than we know what we want. It is a fact. So Elon Musk sees this happening. And if you've watched movies about the robots taking over, that's a scary situation, but that's where we're headed. Quickly. Who knows how quickly, but quickly. There's a computer listening right now. Official intelligence listening in on the service right now. To you as you listen to you. What Elon Musk said. He sees the day that literally AI is going to be a devil that's going to take over the world. What he said. We've got to think about it. So his solution. Some sort of device that is easily grafted in to your brain so that your brain merges with AI. So that AI won't be your enemy, it will be your equal. A symbiotic relationship. Okay? Ticks need people or deer. Right? They need the blood. So AI, we will need AI, AI will need us. And the two will merge. And Elon Musk has the prototype already ready. So here's what he said. How much smarter... You know how we got here? GPS? Use my phone. We do it, don't we? Lisa said at least three times on the way down here, we'd talk and I'd ask her something. She said, well, let me Google that. Okay? How much smarter are you with a phone than without? Your phone is already an extension of you. You are already a cyborg. A human robot. So, for me, I have this tablet. For now, it's external. And we have to use... We're supposed to be driving, right? We won't need our fingers to send the message. We will receive the message. The day will come... All kinds of things that they should not be doing instantaneously this world is going to be turned over is it not? you see it coming? God's going, God's going to let this happen the YouTube algorithm this is articles, YouTube algorithm is promoting Las Vegas conspiracy theories YouTube is teeming with conspiracy theories about the California wildfires, here's what really may have caused the flames, YouTube's conspiracy theory crisis explained Uh, YouTube's content algorithms are incredibly powerful. They determine which videos show up in your search results in the suggested video stream on the home page in the trending stream or under your subscriptions. If you go to the YouTube home page, algorithms dictate which videos you see and which ones you don't. And if you search for something, an algorithm decides which videos you get first. I noticed that recently Google started fluffing up my search thing. I would search for something and Google would send me seven, send me to seven places first that would tell me that what I'm looking for is not really true. Sending me to places and New York Times article. Don't believe the New York Times on anything. Okay? But stuff like that. Google started stacking the deck in their favor. Forcing me, because it looks like, well, that's the answer to my question. Click, read this article. Okay, I guess that's right because Google said so. Uh, an associate, his name, but associate professor at the School of Information Library Science at the University of North Carolina wrote in the New York Times in March, the YouTube advertising model is based on you watching as many videos as they can show you and the ads that appear before and during these videos. You're being controlled. 
You're being controlled. So now turn to 2 Peter. Now, again, I'm a technology person. I'm using it. We're live streaming now. I'm recording now. The, our ability to reach and do what we're doing in Kenya, we couldn't have done 20 years ago. No way. So, it has a use. But at some point, we'll all have to say, here's the line and I'm not crossing it. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of unclean. Second Peter chapter 2 is about the false teachers and the false prophets. Number one, they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. If they lie, deliberately lie, teach false doctrine, the Bible's telling you that they're very lustful too. They're adulterous. Okay? You may not ever see it, but you can know that that's who they are. They despise government, which means they hate authority. They hate authority. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. That means they have assumed things that they say is true that are not true. They make a presumption. Has, any, has, has anybody ever judged you and judged you wrong and then found out you weren't really who they thought you were? Have you ever done that to somebody else? That's presumptuousness. Are they self-willed? They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord, but these as, notice the term here, natural brute what? I want to, I want to circle that. Beasts. That means that their heart has been turned over to a beast nature. Name somebody in the Bible that had that done to them. Nebuchadnezzar. A beast's heart was given to him. This is what's coming to mankind. AI is the beast. Okay? Made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of things that they understand not. It means they do not understand the Bible, so they speak evil of it. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. If nothing else, you'll know where all the books of the Bible are by the time we're done tonight. This, number one, is so you'll understand what happened to some people. How they went from being in right field to left field. How they went from believing to not believing or believing a lie. Or maybe this will ensure that you don't turn out that way. Amen? Deuteronomy 1, And the Lord said unto me, saying to them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and you would not hear but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and went, there it is, presumptuously up into the hill. What did Joshua presume? He presumed that God was with him, but he didn't ask. He did not seek out God. He did it on his own and got his little backside kicked. Lost some of his good men. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in Seir even unto Hormah and you returned and wept before the Lord but the Lord would not hearken your voice nor give ear unto you think of Esau Esau cried but God wouldn't hear him God wouldn't hear him because Esau sinned the sin of presumptuousness he thought that the inheritance would always be his by rights of his being the firstborn, but he lost it. Okay? He chose what was temporary over what was eternal. Turn to Deuteronomy 17. Same book. By the way, I'm using a King James. Thought I'd let you know. Amen. <laughs> Deuteronomy 17, verse 12. And the man that will do presumptuously 
and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God or unto the judge, even that man shall die. This is how serious God takes this. The sin of presumption. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel and all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. Follow this book. Stay within the guidelines of this book. The, the parameters, the rules. Some people are, they think this way. Rules are made to be broken. No, they're not. They're, they're made to be rulers over us. To tell us what to do. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. is profitable for doctrine, for correction. For instruction in righteousness. Because we already know how to live evil. We don't have to be taught that. But we do need to be taught what's right. Deuteronomy 18. Turn there. And it shall come to pass, verse 19, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. You're going to be judged on what God said in his word. You're going to be judged by the book. Okay? And that's fair, is it not? I mean, do we have a God that just is making it up as He goes? Treating some people better than He does other people? See, I despise politicians and police officers and city councils that treat, or preachers that treat people that way. Preachers treat people that way. They have their pet people. And, they, and the preacher gives more to them or is more attached to them or he's buddied up with them than he does other people in the church. He treats them like they're second class Christians. Okay? And that's not his place. And I hate that, and you should hate it too. So it shall come to pass, whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which she shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet, which shall, what's that word? Presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. So preachers telling you what he thinks, what's in his mind, leaving out the Word of God, telling you what he thinks God said to him, or what he dreamed in a dream, or what he saw in a vision, or what he saw on YouTube, or whatever, but he's not giving the Word of God. He is sinning the sin of presumption. He presumes to speak a word in God's name, but God said, I, that's not me. I didn't say it. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods. Notice that plural. Let me ask you the question, what are these gods? Satan? Okay, but there's more than one, right? So who are the rest of them? Did you say Democrats? <laughs> Somebody say that? It's Arkansas, I know where I'm at. Devils. Devils, right? Things that become more important than the scripture. Amen. Yeah, anything like that. But notice he said, speak in the name of other gods. That day's coming, believe it or not. Catholic Church already does it. Catholic Church already does it. Whether they say it's the, what the Pope says or all the saints, they regard all the saints, those that the Catholic Church has given sainthood to, things that they say overrule the Word of God as far as the Roman Catholic is concerned, they're listening to other gods. And they're having things said by other gods. Even that prophet, he said, shall die. So verse 21, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a, spot, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if he, now he's going to answer the question, If the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So God sets a standard here. 
of anybody who would say God said this or God is like this or God is going to do this. There's going to be a sign. There's going to be a wonder. This is going to happen and so on. And I've heard people say, well, man, he's like 99% dead on. I follow this guy because like, like 90% of the things he said was going to happen has happened. But according to God, if he's wrong one time, you don't listen to him. You don't listen to him. So that sets the standard for this book. This book is a sure word of what? Prophecy. So can this book be wrong one time? and be the Word of God. No, it can't be. It has to be absolutely 100% correct in every word, every sentence, every verse, every chapter. It has to be 100% right or it can, it is disqualified from being the Word of God. And God said, you don't have to read that because that is wrong. So, and I, I did this in Kenya, I, I showed them the difference. Even because their Swahili Bible was taken over by the Vatican years ago. They would read the Swahili Bible, but the Vatican got involved in the translation and they retranslated the Swahili Bible to make it ecumenical so that all of the quote-unquote churches could be using this particular Bible in Swahili. And I showed them the difference in Daniel 3.25. Do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that it was Jesus in the fiery furnace? Yes. And I said, Moana wa Mungu, that's Son of God in Swahili. And they said, yes, Moana wa Mungu, Son of God. He was in the fiery furnace. And I said, now open your Swahili Bible. They opened it up to Daniel 3.25 and it said, Moana wa Miyungu. Miyungu is God's plural. And they wept. And the pastor stood up, raised his hand. Mike Hutzel will tell you, he was there. He said, I've been preaching out of a book, but I've not been preaching out of the Word of God. God, forgive me. And we gave out every Bible we had that day to the, in English. King James Bible. Because if he's the son of the gods, that Bible's wrong. And it's wrong once. And you don't listen to it. You don't read it. And you don't read books by people who do. Ooh, did I say that? I'm sorry. Psalm 19. I'll tell you my old habits. My old habits, when I would read books on prophecy, I would read what the author said, and when he quoted scripture, I would skip the scripture because I wanted to hear what the guy said. That's my old habit. And now, God's given me a new habit. Skip what the guy says. I want to see the scripture that he presents. I want to see what God says. Because man lies. God never does. Psalm 19, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you have those, but I know you do. Everybody does. That's why we come to church, is it not? Because we have secret faults. And we don't want to tell everybody, and we don't have to. But we have them, and we don't want them. So we're here every time begging God, have mercy on us. God, please have mercy on us. God, please don't turn us over to a reprobate mind. God, please don't turn us into Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 13, keep back thy servant also from what? Let me, ask you, let me ask you what you think presumptuous sins are. What do you think they are? We've looked at examples, speaking where God didn't speak, saying things that God didn't say, and make it sound like God is like this. Okay? Presumptuous sins, where you think you can do it and get automatically covered by grace. Grace is a... Get out of sin free card so you can sin as much as you want to and God will be okay with that. Yeah, that's presumptuous. Is it not? Now God has a remedy for that because we've all been guilty of it. Don't let me, don't leave me hanging here by myself. We've all been guilty of it. So God has a remedy for that. 
It's called a rod. And as long as God can, can take a rod to you and chasten you like His Son, He'll forgive you. Just like you forgave your children for what they did. And your grandkids for what they did. Why did you do it? Because you love them. And He loves you. So as long as God can chasten you, you're okay. You really are. Let, so keep thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great. Notice that he puts a, the word the in front of great transgression. Like there's one great big giant transgression coming. Is there not? Relate, probably related to that lie that God's going to turn everybody over to. The great transgression. Paul's talked about the evil day. As if there's one day coming when it's where it is absolutely going to be known who is and who ain't. Amen? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. My strength, there he is with the strength again, and my Redeemer. Second, back to 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and what? Belief of the truth. There it is. So let's, let's do a little thinking here for a minute. And go back before time. Go back before God created the heaven and the earth. Did God know about you before the heaven and the earth? Sure he did. Sure he did. Did God know the outcome of all the choices you would make throughout your whole life? Yes, he did. He ain't much of a God if he didn't. He ain't much of a God if you have to carry him around. If he has arms but they don't move. And eyes but they don't see, right? He ain't much of a God if you, he, he can't walk around. So he knows everything. And he wrote your name down before you ever had a thought about God. Because God knew the choices you would make. Amen? Amen. So, it's sanct so He's already sanctified you because He already knows that you will believe the truth. Especially on the day when it really counts. Because after all, have we not had our doubts? I have. I can't control everything that runs through my mind. I have no control over that. But I can choose which ones I'll believe. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. The word fast does not mean quickly or speedily. It means take nails, drive them through your shoes so your feet don't move. Fasten your shoes, your feet down. And hold the traditions which you have been taught, which means the Bible. Hold it. Keep it. Don't let anybody take you away from it or take it away from you. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts. Notice this word. Establish. I love studying words. Etymology is like a hobby of mine. And there is a, there's a, we get our language from all over the world. Latin, Greek, whatever. And there's a Latin root. It's either S-T-A or S-T-E or S-T-O. Any of those variations. And they're in hundreds of words. And they all basically mean they don't move. Statue. Statues don't do what? They don't move. 
When your car comes to this red sign with the words S-T-O-P, you what? Don't move. Stop. Stand. A statute is a law that doesn't change. A stage, be steadfast. See all these words that has that in it? Isn't that neat? That's the word establish. Let God stab you, stick you, so that you are standing steadfast, not moving. And establish you in every good what? Word and work. So that means you'll just believe what God said. Now, do you understand everything God said? No. Do you believe it? Yes. Acts 17. Let's go to the University of Tube. The University of Tube. U Tube. How did, how did people start believing the earth was flat? A guy named Mark Sargent, I think is his name, put a video out, 2016, somewhere around in there, questioning the shape of the earth with ridiculous arguments, utterly ridiculous arguments. And the video went viral. And you have people all over the world. There was a guy that confronted Buzz Aldrin, second man to walk on the moon, confronted him in his face, got in his face, accusing him of faking the moon landing, and Buzz Aldrin just went, pow! Knocked him down. Of course, he had to pay a fine for that. But all of a sudden now, they're having conventions Flat Earth conventions and thousands of people show up and books are written and all kinds of stuff and people are believing it like crazy. And they didn't read it in the Bible, but they claim the Bible has thousands of verses in it that prove the earth is flat. And yet when I ask them to read me one, they never do. Because there isn't one. Okay? So, Acts 17, verse 19. They took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And you know the people who believe all this wacky stuff are the people who sit for hours. Another and then another. And YouTube has already selected the next video for them to watch. And it just piles in their head. The earth is flat. There's a hard shell dome over the earth. We're like in an ice, or what is that, the snow globe. That's what they say. And there's no satellites anywhere. Nobody's been to the moon. There is no outer space. And they make up all of this stuff that's not true. Did you see the sun come up this morning? Did you see it go down? Do you know in a flat earth, the sun can't do that? So here's the earth and it's flat. And they say the sun goes around like this. But that's not true, is it? Because I saw it come up. And the Bible also says, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. And that one verse right there, I went, okay, I'm done. I don't believe the earth's flat. Can't be! Because their sun doesn't rise or fall. Doesn't do anything like that. But everybody wants to hear the new things that are coming out. And so YouTube and Facebook and other social media places fill their heads with this stuff. 
Now, why though do they believe it? Here's how men are deceived. Turn to Matthew 24. So, I'm going to start the message now. Thank you for hanging with me. Here's the preaching now. Matthew 24. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, shall deceive many. Who are the many and where are they coming from? I'm setting you up. Because I, I am going to do something Friday. You might not want to be here, okay? <laughs> Matthew 24, 11. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Jeremiah 48, 10. Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. He does the work of the Lord deceitfully. So how are these? We know they are. Be not deceived. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Evil communications. Corrupt good manners. Now when he says good manners, he's not talking about elbows off the table and don't burp in front of people. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the manner of life that God has given us to live out of this book. The evil communications that come at us, the onslaught of evil communications will corrupt the Word of God in you. And it will twist it and turn it so that you believe something that is contrary to what God said. Romans 3.12, they are gone, all gone out of the way. They are, all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. This is why your breath stinks. Amen. Your throat is an open sepulcher. It stinks like dead people. And where their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing, and bitterness. Ephesians 4, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind. Who's got, anybody got a quarter? Anybody got a quarter? Quarter? Anything like that? You got a quarter? Thanks, I appreciate it. That's a pretty good trick, wasn't it? Okay. Okay. Now, you can have it back. I only learned one trick. Slight of men. Okay? And there's people that do this way better than me. Okay? But that's what that means. They trick people. They deceive people. They get you to look here while the deceitfulness is here. There you go. Um, Ephesians 5, 6, let the man deceive you with vain words. If, they didn't, if it's not the word of God, it's vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Colossians 2, beware lest any man spoil you through the philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. You can go get a PhD and believe that the earth evolved and animals evolved and us, we evolved and everything happened over 13 billion years, but none of that is true. Right. And let me tell you something. Don't let these people put you down. If you believe God created the earth in six days, about six thousand years ago, you're smarter than every university in this world. Amen. Amen. Uh, Job 15. I'm going to move through some of this. If you want to get ahead of me, go to Ezekiel 14. Okay? Because that's eventually where I'm headed. I'm going to try to hurry. Let not man... Let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. It shall be accomplished before this time, and his branch shall not be green. He shall shake off his unripe grape as the vine, and shall cast off his flower as the olive. For the congregation of hypocrites. How many of those churches are around? Amen. Don't let it be this one. Don't let it be this one. Be real. Come to church and be real. Amen. Listen, there's sinners out there that are looking. They are looking for a real Jesus. And people who follow Him for real. People who don't pretend that they don't have anything wrong with them. They are looking for that. Because I started doing teachings on depression and anxiety and even addictions... I got a letter from a lady saying that she's got people listening to some of my sermons who are not even saved. But they deal with depression, they deal with anxiety, they deal with addictions. And they're hearing the Word of God. 
And it will change them. Amen? Now watch this. Oh, tabernacles of bribery? That's why some people turn from the truth. That's why some people swear to protect and defend the Constitution, but don't really... Like certain presidents and certain secretaries of states and certain senators and representatives who tear up speeches. They conceive mischief and bring forth vanity and their belly prepares deceit. Obadiah 1.3, the pride, here it is. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Where did he say the deception was? The heart. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Hebrews 3.13, deceitfulness of sin, deceitful lust, deceitfulness of riches. Moving through some of this. Come on, there we go. The heart is really wicked. Who can know it? Your heart is. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. Deceiving your own self. Can you believe your own lies? Hey, the brother back here want me to preach on deer season. Amen? Got any deer stories? I got a few. And for some reason, they don't really match what really happened. Are we not like that? It's in our nature. But then something happens. We start believing the lie that even we made up. And we know we made it up. And we start believing it to be the truth. We start creating a God that is not found anywhere in here. A God after our image and not the real God. This man bridleth not his tongue. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. For many deceivers are in into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Um, they, sh- they shall do great signs and wonders. Matthew 24, 24. Revelation 13. By means of these miracles which he had power to do, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. Uh, Revelation 18, 23. By thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. Work, uh, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him which he hath deceived them. Psalm 119, we read a lot of these. Prophecy not unto... Here's, here's the modern church. Isaiah 30 verse 10. Here's the modern church. They say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. They want that preacher to lie to them. That's why that congregation is full. That's why that church is full. That's why Joel Osteen doesn't have an empty chair anywhere in his church. It's because they want him to lie to them. And he does it. And he gets paid very well for it too. Jeremiah 14. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. It's happening everywhere. Churches everywhere. Free will Baptist churches. Baptist churches. Southern Baptist. General Baptist. Independent Baptist. American Baptist. All Baptist. Pentecostal. Methodist. Presbyterian. On and on and on. Preaching lies and not preaching the Word of God. Proverbs 21. Boy, strong drink. Liquor. Alcohol. That'll lie to you, won't it? That'll make you believe stuff that ain't true, won't it? There's a spiritual drink that God will pour out unto you and He'll put in you a false spirit. Think of what happened to Saul. What happened to Saul? When Saul started out, he's prophesying with the prophets. He's preaching the right... He's preaching the Word of God. But then Saul... I mean... Compare Saul and Solomon. We have a long list of sins that Solomon committed, don't we? A long list of sins. Solomon confessed them all. We only have one recorded sin of Saul. And he rejected the word of the Lord. He rejected the Bible. Samuel to him was the Bible. And Saul rejected it and then lied about it. And Samuel said, 
Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee. And the Bible specifically says that the spirit of the Lord left Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord came to him. And what religion did he end up turning himself over to at the end of his life? A familiar spirit that looked like Samuel, but it was not Samuel. You know how I know? Because the Bible says right before that story that God would not speak to Saul by prophet, by Urim, or by vision. So he goes and he has... By the way, where does the false prophet come from in Revelation 13? Where does it come from? The sky? Does it come out of the sun? Where does he come from? It comes up from the earth. Where did the witch of Endor see these gods coming from? Out of the earth. And one of them was Samuel. Or one of them looked like Samuel. He was the anti-Samuel. You understand that? It's a picture of the false Jesus. And Saul fell for it. And paid for it with his life. God turned him over to that. Ezekiel 14. That's where I told you, right? So let's read this for a minute. Verse 1. Let me see if I have this here. Yeah, verse 1. We'll, we'll, we'll stop here in a minute. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their what? Now I look around this church, there's no statues of Jesus, no statues of Mary holding a baby, no statues of St. Joseph or anything like that. If I were to go to your house, probably I would not see a statue of Jesus or Mary out in the garden or anything like that. But these guys didn't have idols sitting out where everybody could see them. They had them hidden in their heart where nobody could see them. But they were there. God knew they were there. God saw them. So these elders came to Ezekiel and they said, "Um, we want to hear the word of the Lord. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put this stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, thus saith the Lord. Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. That I may take the house of Israel in their own what? Because they are all estranged from me through their idols. So look at verse 9. And if the prophet spoken a thing... I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Think about that statement. Now think about what's happening. They came to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, all the prophets, represent the Bible. And they come and they say, tell us what God says. But see, God knows that they have built a different God in their heart. And so if what God actually says to them doesn't match what they've already contrived in their heart, they won't believe it anyway. So when I hit that one, Brother Jamie, about this friend of mine, that scared me. Because I asked God, how did he get deceived like this? How did he fall for this? So I don't know what it is. But there is a stumbling block in people's hearts that they refuse to get rid of. Refuse. Because they've already accepted this is how it is. I knew a man, I've known him most of my life. He was a high school science teacher. Would never get saved, never get saved. His wife came to church. He would never, preachers, go see him, try to talk to him. He wouldn't hear it. He, finally, they retired. He started, him and his wife started going to a different church. He started going. He went down to the altar and said he accepted Jesus. 
Everybody rejoiced. This man's already retired. He was in his 70s. Was going to that church for about a year. And I know the pastor. The pastor is a good man, believes the Bible. He got up on a Sunday night and he preached Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that man started getting mad. And he said, God created the earth in six days, 6,000 years ago. The Bible says it right there. We've, we've got the genealogies of the people in the Bible. We know about the time when it started. We know it was six, and we know it was six literal days. And that man jumped at that preacher after that service. He said, how can you be so ignorant as to believe something like that? Stumbling block in that man's heart. An idol. A different God than what's here. And he walked out of that church. Now he's dead. I'm not the man's judge. I, ref I can't be. But I know what he said and I know what happened. Whatever's here has got, God's got to sit on a clean throne. Amen? So, how, when he said, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, how did that even happen? Does God tell a prophet a lie? No. There's a story. There's a story of how God did it. Turn to 1 Kings. Chapter 22, the setup is Ahab, God's going to fulfill what he swore to Ahab. Ahab, in the place where Naboth was killed, the dogs are going to lick your blood, Ahab, for stealing Naboth's vineyard and having him killed. So God's going to fulfill what he said. Ahab is looking to go to war. And he wants to know, and he's got this, he's got to have this in the back of his mind. Dogs licking up his blood. So he wants somebody to tell him that it's going to be okay to go to war. What does he want? Does he want the truth? No, he didn't want the truth. He wants to know, he wants somebody to tell him that what he's about to do. See, it's a presumptuous sin, is it not? So, he says, I've got my, four, i got 400 guys. Preachers, come preach to me. So they all told him, oh, see, they, one made iron horns. See these horns? Oh, with these horns, you're going to prevail. Oh, oh, bless God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So then Jehoshaphat, he's, try, he's trying to get Jehoshaphat in on it. Jehoshaphat says, I, I didn't hear a Bible verse here. I didn't hear a half or a thee or a thou when these guys talked. Right? You don't hear no thee and thou. That ain't no Bible that you want to listen to. Amen? So verse 19. Here's Micaiah. Ahab says, I, we got this guy, I don't like him. Why don't you like him? He don't tell me what I like to hear. Verse 9, this is what Micaiah said. Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. All the host of heaven. Every spirit, every God, both good and bad. Who controls them all? God does. They don't do nothing but what He allows it or He sends it. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? See that f word fall? For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't fall, did they? Everybody else did. So wasn't it obvious on that day who served God and who didn't? Oh, you got to look and see who's still standing. And that's how it's going to be, people. There's coming a day when you're either going to be standing 
or you will have fallen. Pick one. Pick one. Then he made fall at Ramoth Gilead, and one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also, go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. So what did Ahab do? He went and fell the next day. He chose the deception over the truth. God had already turned him over to it. Amen? So this is how it works. Whatever sin haunts you, whatever sin follows you, whatever sin chases you, whatever sin gets at you the most, that's the one you got to watch out for. Because that thing will lie to you and make you think that it's okay for you to do this and God's all right with it. But the Bible says He's not. And once that thing gets built up in your heart, God will answer you according to that stumbling block. And what does the stumbling block cause people to do? Fall. And that's exactly how it works. That scares me. Because there are preachers falling. Some that we knew. Churches falling. Our whole nations falling. Not, I mean, I think we still got some people standing. God, we're not done. We're not done. Don't give up. Don't quit. Okay? It may get better. We don't know. But whatever that sin is, have God run it out. Clean your heart out. You won't believe. You won't have. You won't have to worry about them lies. You won't believe them. Okay. I want you to bow your head. I'm going to close in prayer, but I just want I want to give you some time. I, 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 this way, I pastor. I mean, we've got benches up front, and we'll sometimes we'll have people come. Sometimes they won't. I mean, I, it just I decided to quit selling the altar call with my sermons because I was judging myself about how many people came to the altar. That wasn't a good sermon. I didn't get nobody to the altar. I'm not interested in what you do tonight. I'm interested in whether or not you're going to be here 10 years from now if the Lord tarries is coming. Are you still going to be believing the old time way? Sticking to the Word of God. You're going to get rid of them idols. Quit creating a God that's not the God of this Bible. Father in heaven, come before you tonight. I love these people, my friends. I love this church. I love Arkansas. It's the land of my birth. And there's some good people and there's some bad people. And some of them go to church. And God, you're the only one who knows who is and who isn't. Well, Father, my prayer is tonight that God's people be warned, be careful, walk circumspectly like soldiers looking around, seeing where the enemy could be hiding. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know how he works. He's very subtle. And Father, I pray for these people. God, I'm not above them. We all, God, have done unrighteous things. All of us. We all had secret faults. Father, we ask God that nothing to us is more important than believing the truth which will make us free. So Father, whoever hears me tonight, whether they're here, whether they're watching online, God, 
take the idols down, tear them up. Like Josiah did. Like the kings before did. Tore down the idols, tore down the, the groves, cut them up, busted them to pieces. Like David said, create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in us. Cast us not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. So Father, bless this church and its people and their leaders and their men and their families. Father, help them, dear God, to remove the stumbling blocks so they'll stand when everybody else falls. Bless them, we pray in Jesus. God's people said, Amen.